school. Andrew graduated a couple years ago from the audio arts program, master's degree at Newhouse at Syracuse. And uh, he like had a lot of different interests. He was into post-production. He was into um, being a musician himself and engineering. I don't know. You had like a lot of different interests. And then Jack of all trades, master of own. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, you went to LA. Did you do the immersion? Um, yeah, I did the the capstone, not the capstone, the benchmark trip okay. out here for a week. And then I got an internship. Through, we can get through all the bio okay. stuff. Um, so yeah, so the one year program, they do a trip in the middle to go to LA and figure out if they like it, music industry and all that kind of fun stuff. So he, I guess, liked it because he's out there now. So a bad place to be. <laughs> Andrew's here to tell us all about what the music scene is in LA and hopefully get some like new ideas from you guys on what you guys are interested in so you can go find these artists for you and they can be the next big thing 100 percent. should I just hop into the uh the presentation sure awesome we'll get all the oh this is rainfall so this is less important. Why am I only on rainfall? Give me a hot sec. Check there we go. Sorry about that. Yeah. All right. Hey, what's up? I'm Andrew. These transitions are really slow, so I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, as Shanna said, audio arts, 22, graduated, moved out here. Um, the transitions will come. So you might be wondering, like, who am I? Who's making this presentation? I'm the guy who made this presentation. Um, and then in, sorry, let me talk to these people. Oh, they're gone. Sweet. Uh, <laughs> I got my undergrad in music recording and technology at Youngstown State University did that did a bunch of like weird recording projects recorded orchestras recorded like jazz bands and did a bunch of like indie music in the in the midwest emo scene and the noise scene out in like Pittsburgh and Cleveland and did that for a while um then I took a gap year where I lived in Florida doing like hot air balloon pilot valet um worked at a restaurant full of sharks a bunch of weird different gigs down there and then ended up at Syracuse, um, did the audio arts program and really enjoyed it. And that's where I landed the three internships that I did. I did the DASIC internship, which was like a AI algorithm that researched up and coming new artists and tried to hit trends before they actually like popped and researching them. Um, I worked at the Ogan Lessie group during the summer after Syracuse. And that was a uh, they managed like Young Thug, Yeet, Mariah the Scientist, um, and Charlie on a Friday and a few other artists. So I worked just interning and learning about the industry through there. And then also Position Music, which is a publisher up in the Valley of LA. Um, and they do a bunch of more sync based music, um, which was uh, pretty fun and exciting. And I got to work with like artists like Zvi and a lot of a lot of listening to songs. By the way, if you have any questions throughout any of this, uh, feel free just to throw it in the chat or to get something to pay, get my attention. And we'll, uh, this is very just like fluid, whatever happens, happens. Um, so I guess that's kind of the background of where I was, so, but this is more of like who I am now. Um, these are the first three pictures that show up when you search my name. And that's depressing. I You can guess which one I am. Um, but currently, I'm a day-to-day -day manager at ATC. So I work underneath uh, a main manager. Her name's Emily. I'm going to be talking about her a lot, probably. Um, but she's kind of like my mentor within the music industry. And I work on her roster and her roster exclusively, just working on a bunch of different things that they need, whatever that be. 
those clients are AO the producer. He did WAP with Cardi B. He just did Closer Than This with Jimin. And he has a few James Smith stuff as well. A bunch more artists and stuff along the way. But we'll get to that. Boz Von Dahlen, uh, he did... He does a bunch with David Guetta, Diplo. He has a new Perry Edwards single coming out soon. Uh, the Little Mix, one of the Little Mix people. And then just a bunch of, he's a producer on that side. Dakota, she, Dakota, she's a songwriter. Did Fast Car with Jonas Blue and a few others just in the electronic space and singer-songwriter space. And then Dizzy Faye is an R&B pop artist. Um, on the side, I also work with like Petey and Draw, who are two like LA-based indie artists um just kind of working the scene um but i work with them kind of like outside of atc um just working with them and building up indie rosters because i love the indie scene so much um but where i thought we could kind of take this conversation is especially with like how broad it is in this generally being a post-production kind of club but um i thought i'd open it up to letting you guys kind of pick what we talk about. Um, so we could, if you guys don't pick anything, we could end the conversation, but I feel like Shannon would lynch me or something. So that'd be fun. Um, but we could talk about like how I got the job I have, moving to LA, getting into the scene, day-to-day -day management. We could talk about art if we want, how creatives can build teams, so like artists getting management, publishers, et cetera. Um, general knowledge, like, am I saying words that you don't know? Like, do we want to talk about those words and figure those out? admin side, producer, songwriter, artist agreement, the creator economy, which is a fun little buzzword, or uh, you guys can just like ask any question you want and, uh, and see. So I can, uh, I was planning on just like going on a rant kind of about any of these and seeing what happens. So if any, is anyone interested in any of these particular topics? And if not, I can just pick one. And we can go about. Someone shout one out. What moving, is moving to LA. That was the first one. Yeah, and we'll get we'll get through them. They're they're the quick little rants. Um, moving to LA is stressful. I've been here twice before I moved. Once was just a fun trip. I went to Nam. If anyone's familiar with that, it's like a music convention. But then I also went to like the Riot Games esports arena just because I'm a nerd and I loved that. So doing that and then so that was like a quick vacation thing I didn't really understand LA that first time and then the second time was the Syracuse trip and that was uh just fully organized and I didn't really know what was going on because I was on a bus half the time so I didn't really understand but moving to LA uh it's very like neighborhood oriented and very just kind of hop in and hope and figure it out because I know I know some people who have like just drove out here and Airbnb it until they found a place and they they found a place. Some people plan it. Um, it kind of just depends on your experience and your like comfortableness with moving. But moving to LA specifically is just like, I, I think a big thing for a lot of people is understanding the scale and like understanding really like neighborhoods. Because LA is like, it's a, um, there's 83, I think, different neighborhoods within LA. So each one is like very specific and very different. And like the travel distance between like downtown LA and Santa Monica could be on some nights, like an hour and a half to two hours. So like understanding that being only like 10 miles, but like contextualizing it with the ability of travel is really important. But really it's just kind of a lot of the success that I see from people out here who are doing it or just, is just kind of hopping in and, uh, trying their best to yeah to get out here yeah see the e-train the monorail or the the metro is rarely used but props for using the metro i use it a bunch um but not a lot of la actual people do parking out here sucks um you got to find your little parking hacks and everything but moving out here it's very much uh one of the starkest dis differences that i found moving out here versus like being on the east coast was um like getting into your niche of whatever you're trying to get into like me specifically was music was very like it's very social based um a lot of it is going out and like just hanging out with people i went out to shows or different if you're trying to get into it like 
going to mixers or, or whatever it is and just slowly meeting people over the first little bit. The, when I moved here, I was working the two internships during the day, but then I was going out like six times a week at night just to different shows and different things. And sometimes I would talk to no one and just be the guy on my phone in the back of the room. But then I would meet one person and then a week later, I'd see them at again at a show just because like I was going to things that I enjoy and that I love and they'd be open to talking about those things as well. And just kind of building from there um, is, I I think, the best way to get to, into L.A., um, especially in music. But it's kind of, you just really have to, like, dive headfirst in. It's that kind of city from the feeling of it. I hope that covered a lot. What about moving there without, with unpaid work? Um. The gig culture is amazing here, but it's also stressful, like, because everyone's on gig. So like signing up for Uber in your city and then doing it before and kind of like I did WAG for a while, which is like a dog walking service, which I still do a little bit these days just because I don't have a dog and I want to walk a dog every once in a while. Um, But doing that is really important. But I, I personally had savings set up from that gap year that I did. So I had three months of savings kind of telling myself like, I, I got to make it work. And luckily I did, but it is, it's, it's not the most realistic thing unless you really believe in yourself and you really just jump in and, and try really hard. And then at the same time, like the day I got my job or at least a, an inkling of that, I was going to get the job with like a salary and, and surviving was the day I I had an interview at like Mendocino Farms, which is like a sub, a sandwich place to work their cash register. So it was like, it is very close to being flip floppy of like making it or just being stuck at like Subway. So it's not the easiest, but if, if you want to do it and you get into the right scenes and you, you keep doing it like every night, it, it, uh, it can pay off, but definitely having like a little cushion is suggested but then at the same time it's kind of like move to la make your dreams come true kind of vibes um are there any other questions on moving to la or should i just keep following the uh the chat questions and you guys can feel free to just like talk as well i don't i feel bad when it's just me ranting yeah, the next one in the uh, chat was from uh, Kimberly. Oh, amazing. How do you choose an artist to support or manage? Um, It's literally the best way to kind of describe it is dating. Um, I'm going to stop sharing for now just so we can all talk. Um, It's it's literally just dating. And it's, it's tough because you're getting into like an insane relationship with someone where it's you are their person and they're your person like depending on how you work like they have to be they're trusting you with their art and that's very important um so then like really being like okay do we get along personally do we hang out outside of just working like what does that all look like and how do you feel within that and can you bring up like the tough stuff um but then it's also helpful that like you really have to show them that I like the client is the client and I'm always fighting for them no matter what. I'm always fighting for like the best thing to happen, but always, always really fighting for the artist, but really it's just kind of like personal taste. The two acts that I work on the side um, that are like my personal projects, like PD and Drav, um, I'll send out a link to them eventually, but they're like, I met them both on TikTok when I was a student at Syracuse. And then I moved out here and met them in person. One PD, I ran to her at a show just randomly um, and getting in the right scene. And then I met her. I was the first person to recognize her off TikTok. And then we slowly built a friendship through that um, and talked more and more, just being at different shows together. And then Drav were the first people that put me in contact with like the first show I went to in Los Angeles. And then I started talking more and more with them and then we just started talking creatively together and that's kind of how it started like if I found someone on TikTok or Spotify that I really liked but um I didn't know them I wouldn't be like immediately like I want to manage you I'd be like hey let's be friends and see what happens and 
just be like, okay, cool. This is, you're doing something cool. I'm doing something cool. Can we, can we do something cool together? Or is it more of just like, it, it doesn't make sense because it's all personal preference um, for that. And then also it's like an artist, an artist, you don't really want to reach out to people too much. It's more, you want to more nowadays it's get discovered by people and the uh, people in the industry are always looking for stuff. So it's figuring out how to get it in front of their eyes without really telling us that you put yourself in front of our eyes. Cause if someone shows up or like gets a dry email, if someone dry emails me, I'm not going to respond nine times out of 10, unless the music and the art is amazing. Kimberly, does that answer your question or are there any other like nuances or things within that? Do you have a question on? Yeah, you answered it. Thank you. Uh, from Jacob, what is the creator economy? Oh, the creator economy is basically, so creators in general are the like, like YouTubers, TikTokers, any, anyone who does like content creation and the creator economy, some great podcasts to listen to are like Colin and Samir or um, they're really the, the top one, but basically just following along. The reason I had it on the slide was because I think creatives and creators are doing things that music should be following uh, because those two economies, the music economy or the music industry and the creator industry are very, they're the closest together in terms of like the, just how diverse they are from each other. And then what's happening there and how you can be creative and what mediums you're being creative through. Um, I think those are super similar in terms of like how fast you can go. So keeping an eye on other industries, whether it be TV, film, uh, the creator economy, um, like Twitch, YouTube, TikTok, and what those people are doing and applying it to music is something that I very much follow. Um, but I hope that explains creator economy. Definitely check out Colin and Samir. They're a YouTube channel that does a bunch of podcasts, but they did one with like Mr. Beats, Beast's manager from Night Media, and they just bring on YouTubers to talk about like the business side of it and how they approach like deals and everything. And I think it's really really important to pay attention to especially with like new media moving and understanding all of those spaces because they they're the ones who are doing it so we need to pay attention to them uh jacob that that worked for you yeah thank you brilliant hayden uh how creatives build teams and the noise wrecks i don't have any noise wrecks off the top of my head i have a there's a hyper ska guy called eichlers out of the bay area that is amazing um, but that's the closest to I have to noise right now, unfortunately. It's been years since I've been in that market. Um, but how creators build teams, it's a lot of that kind of dating phase um, and like being in the scene that you want to be in and then building from there. It's really sick to just be a part of the scene and, and work with people and, and hang out with people and eventually it might make sense to hop on but I think the best thing a creative can do especially right now after like all the TikTok stuff has kind of slowed down a little bit in terms of how artists blow up is just like do really cool things and consistently do really cool things and then you'll have people kind of reaching out and being like wow I really like what you're doing very excited for what you're doing let's see if maybe we work together and then it's the creative's job to kind of act and date them a little bit and be like okay are you someone who's just trying to use me because they're cool or they're someone that you actually really fuck with and you'd like and you want to work with them on like a a personal level but the best way to build the team is to just do cool things and people will come eventually and then actually how to choose them is really important because you could have a label be like hey we want to give you a record deal and we want to like develop you but it's like okay why why are you taking that label deal? Are you taking it because they have the industry know-how and like how to build you up and everything? And, or are you just taking it because there's a big number and we like money? Like what really, what are you giving away for that? You're giving away like your copyright ownership. So that is, um, that's something to pay attention to. And it's just like people, especially indie artists and indie acts who don't really like, know the the industry as well 
get very excited about if someone reaches out and is like, Hey, whoa, oh my God. And then like, it, it's a little over excitement. I 100% feel that, but it's being like, okay, what value are they actually adding? What can they do? And being kind of uh, particular about that is really important from the creative side. Cause if you have a, a manager hop on and they're taking 20% of your income, like it is the value they're adding worth 20% of your income. And you really have to make sure of that or is, or is like, is getting a label deal worth giving up all of the rights to your music for 10 to 25 years? Like really, is that, is that worth it? Um, a lot of the time, especially right now, it's, it's not really. Um, but yeah, that's, that's something to be important. And then, uh, having a lawyer is almost a necessity. That is, that is one of the most important things you can start to lock down early because I contracts are hard. <laughs> uh, Hayden, does that work for you? Any other questions within that, that space? Uh, that was, that was awesome. Thank you very much. 100%. Feel free, if you guys have any follow-up questions, just unmute and just talk. This we, I want to keep this personally very casual and uh, just open a conversation and, and start. Um, let me share my screen one more time and see if there's any... Did I close it? Oh, my God. Oh, there it is. Uh, Andrew, on your last point, um, what um, situations we need regarding like contract um, have you needed a lawyer specifically for? Um... Um, I personally haven't had a lawyer need a lawyer yet. The two artists I work with, PD and Drav, they gotcha. are indie for me to like to actually paper anything. And it's just very much talking until there's a yeah. business in place and this enjoyment. But like in general, if you go to an agreement with like management or um, or if you have a publisher put a deal in front of you and you don't understand like songwriting terms, like what copyright ownership master versus publishing ownership and all that stuff like and then there's certain things where it's like do you have an option which is like an, an extension of the contract like all these things that are just very intensely complicated and you need like someone to sit and explain it to you is super important just for literacy but even if you feel like literate enough to know that um a lot of people in the industry we don't necessarily like working with an artist that isn't our own or a creative that isn't our own because the purpose of management and the purpose of a lawyer or someone is to kind of be the bad guy because if we if we get a deal and it's a bad deal and it's like i don't want to be going to this person that our client creatively works with and being like hey here's all the bad news for you so having a team and having a, a lawyer, especially, or a manager in place to kind of be that fodder, be that bad guy all the time between you and the other creatives that you're working with, because at the end of the day, people, you know, if we're talking six figures, someone's going to get a little pissy about it. So you got to, you got to figure that out. Um, but having a lawyer is super important. Um, Nathan. How do you foresee working on contracts? Do you have templates? Are you planning on working with a lawyer to make your own? I've been making my own creative contracts. Since... Yeah. Um, having a lawyer is super important. Um, I think for stuff like split sheets and very basic things, you can download basically anything. If you have an archive before you have like a proper lawyer, because paying them is a lot and it's difficult. But if you can just have like something agreed to on paper, that you have like a screenshot of an email that everyone sent or an archive of an email that everyone's like, hey, these are the agreed things or like a screenshot, of, like something where it's like, hey, these are all the agreed things, then that can really help until you get like a lawyer on the team. Um, and it can just be kind of like whatever, however you want to um, format it. It's not necessarily too difficult, but the main thing you want to make sure is of that you have all of your of the rights so the songwriting and the master rights of your music all like in place and who owns what and then once you have who owns what it it's whatever you can you can get past that but figure out who owns what and making sure that everyone's paid for what they're own they own if you have those before you bring on a lawyer 
the lawyer will love you. Um, but if you don't, then um, we're going through a bunch of admin stuff right now because some people that we brought on uh, did not have that. And it makes your life very hell. So making sure you have the admin side down is, is very important. Uh, how do you feel about the SoundCloud email rap scene? This is a deep question. Oh my God. Um, genuinely no idea. Are you talking like KSI Jake Paul type shit? I'm talking about like Lil Peep and those guys. Oh, like X and shit. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's okay. I mean, I don't I think they influenced like there's probably a route that you can see with like Kai Senat being popping off because they paved the route. Um but I yeah. I I haven't given thought to that, but that's a sick thing to think about. <laughs> I've always thought that 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 scene was very influential just because of how underground and lo-fi it was and bringing it to the mainstream, it was very, very kind of interesting phenomenon until all of them just died or whatever, you know? Yeah, I think it it helped, pro it probably helped push to like, be like, oh, we can just do that kind of stuff. Um, but in terms of like, it's actual concrete, like following the roots of the emo rap scene into like now with like can i draw a relationship from lil peep to mr beast i don't know <laughs> but uh i, I want to think about that now yeah unfortunately I don't, I don't know off the top of my head <laughs> all right let me know when you've uh thunk about it yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna do a lot of research now uh it's the later night all right hi um any other topics that you guys want to tackle do you, are, are you guys am i throwing out words that anyone's um less than knowledgeable on yeah it might be a nice uh thing to dig into just a, a general knowledge vocabulary yeah i can 100 percent um do you mind if we pause the sharing or the recording what is the art you do outside of music um i'm <laughs> i'm building a table right now so that's really fun um and that's and then i'm drawing in i actually have it with me i'm drawing in this little book of just like um different like places around la and i went to canada for a little bit but just doing like this is a home depot in hollywood and just doing dumb stuff like that but i think one of the most important things is like people in music the only thing we do is work in music that's it like it's nothing except for music 24 7 um and a lot of people in music have like things outside of it that they can do so it's something that's been very important to me is like do something outside of music and art and and try to enjoy myself as much as I can um and then do I manage myself in theory I hadn't indie artist project called potentially Arizona but it's kind of dead because something that's worth mentioning is like if you get into the business side of music especially if like your business creative like if you're an A&R which is like part of record labels or if you're at um if you're in management and you're working directly with the artists the artist isn't necessarily going to want you to be like an artist in your own right along with their A&R because say an opportunity comes they want to know you're working for them 100 versus like kind of trying to find an in for yourself um so balancing those for anyone who wants to get into like management or um a and r specifically is being like okay stepping away from the the music creative and i still have like fun little avant-garde projects here and there um but in terms of pursuing music professionally as a thing that is something i've fully not given up on but like tabled and that not an active thought in my mind on that side um do you feel that creators themselves have become commodities alongside adjacent to their art due to the parasociality and direct consumer branding inherent to social media yeah 100 
creators are like every other person, especially out here that you run into is like a TikTok, like everyone has a hundred thousand followers on something kind of vibe. So everyone, like it is very commonplace and it's very like, I cannot tell the difference between half of the top hundred people, you know, it's like the sound sounds very similar and like people, um, it's, it's just very easy, but then something, especially with the TikTok blow up happened is a lot of the conversations right now that are happening in industry and in coffees that I have is very much like, um, looking for something genuine, looking for something that's like someone's just doing an art. If you haven't checked out Bobby fingers out of Ireland, one of the greatest visual artists, sculptors that I've seen in the past couple of years that is, he's doing insane stuff. He made like a Jeff Bezos rowboat, um, like a large Jeff Bezos head. And then like Michael Jackson on fire diorama that turns into a satanic ritual type thing. But like people who are making art and stuff like that is something very important. I was just reading like a book and it defined content more as something that just is meant to spread with no message. So like, if you guys remember the Instagram egg back in the day, that is just content that is meant to spread versus art that can be content um, is something very different. I feel like a lot of people are making just content right now where it's just, they're just doing something to get it out and shouting their message and hoping that their message spreads, even though there isn't a message versus like, I think a lot of people, and it'll take years for this to happen, but a lot of people are more trending back towards finding art that they enjoy and can be a part of. Um, like, think what you will. Skibbity toilet is art. And if you don't know Skibbity toilet, you're not paying attention. Alongside that, I'm curious how much work you do in um, marketing or managing the artist compared to their work that they're doing. Like, how much are you trying to get this, like, brand of the artist versus specific songs or, you know, pieces they've done? Yeah. I think the ideal is to work with someone who is an artist fully in and of themselves, capital A artist. Um, Cause if there is a separation between the art and their personality, then it kind of, there's something that's a red flag to me where it's like, I don't really want that to be a thing. Like whenever um, Oliver tree released his uh, country, album he fully was like a country guy so separating that personality from the art isn't necessarily that that would be a red flag if it picked up to me because at a certain point it has transitioned a little bit away from promoting just the music to promoting a person who is primarily a musician but if they don't have a personality a little bit with i think someone brought up the parasocialness of creators like people want personality in the thing and they want to be able to see how much that is so it's really i think the main thing of managing that is like okay how much personality do we show at that point do we do it where we constantly create art and all these easter eggs and then let people find it or do we want to show that part of it and be like hey we are thinking about that and it's it's balancing that line and that's like an every every artist takes it differently like the chance that you see Rihanna do all the things and like go live and talk about like how they created the album, and everything very slim. So she's kind of backed off a little bit, but like if you find an indie artist on TikTok from Syracuse or something, they're probably going to be putting a bunch of stuff in your face because they want to be found. So it's, it's balancing that and, and knowing what's tasteful for each individual artist. Do you, do you prefer artists that are doing like, one specific track kind of like they're making music or they're making a certain kind of music and it's very easy to fit them in a niche or do you prefer or accept artists that are doing many different kinds of media um i think if they're doing a bunch of different media it needs to make sense like um yeah it just needs to make sense on what they're doing um if like take underscores for example we manage underscores here is anyone familiar with underscores 
No, they're they're up and coming hyper pop artists, but they're very multimedia. They do a bunch of like uh graphics and and music and and a bunch of different things. Um and all of it's cohesive around her and like makes sense around her. But if someone's doing a visual piece where they like they do country, but then it's an old like hard style techno visual and it just like doesn't make sense unless they really lean into it. So just definitely I think cohesiveness is the main thing that needs to come out of it if they're doing multiple things. Um, Cause you can always pivot. It just needs to make a little bit of sense. If someone releases an album or an, even an EP with like an R and B track, a techno track and a sing singer songwriter track, th they'd have to have something truly spectacular about them for that to make sense. Hope that covers it. Who was your number one Spotify artist last year? Um, I think it was me. I think I listened to a lot of myself. Is either me or Petey, uh, the artist that I'm working on. But I didn't post my Spotify rap this year for a reason. Because <laughs> that artist project is very dead. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, I think Petey is probably the number one listened to now. Just because I like, I'm working with her, but I'm also like literally her biggest fan. And it's just really cool. And like making that happen is really important. Because if you're not a fan of this stuff, then you get tired and bored. But every time she goes into a session and I get a new song, it's like it's like Christmas Eve. And I just I'm so excited every time. And that's that's what it's for. Did you share a link yet? Oh, I did not. That's awkward. <laughs> um pd is amazing and definitely like finding and sitting and really figuring out we have a lot of like late night talks of just like okay how do you want to be an artist how do you want to pursue this what's and then like logistically what can we actually do but i shared pd and then i also shared drive but uh we're, we're working with very small beans right now um in terms of like clout and whatever it's it's very small beans but I think it's some of the coolest stuff. And so the amount of beans doesn't necessarily matter. So this is someone you're managing outside of your job, right? Yeah. PD so is how does that work? Draw. Is, that is that a conflict of interest? Is that? Yeah, it's very much a conflict of interest because if you work at a company, um, they are not an ATC artist because rosters for companies are very important and the aesthetic of those rosters so they have to fit in with a certain certain like uh a certain vibe. So I work with PD and Draw, but very much exclusively outside of ATC. Um, and then eventually if they start making enough money, it makes sense for them. Uh but yeah. Have a good one, Ryan. Uh why do you feel that an artist has to be cohesive in their work? Have you had examples of your clients failing to reach an audience because they cannot easily be marketed to an ingle, into a single niche? Why can artists not be pointed towards multiple markets? I think an artist can be pointed towards multiple markets, but it's, it just becomes really difficult, especially with like algorithmically and where they're pushing. If they're, it depends on where they're pushing. Cause if they're pushing in TikTok um then it's it's difficult because the algorithm they're going to be posting one thing one day and another thing another day and they're not going to really like under the algorithm is not going to understand where they're landing and it's going to just try to push one thing to someone else who doesn't want it and it, it it's not really going to get to where they want to go versus like an artist who's kind of tackling a niche or tackling a, an aesthetic that's something that where someone people of like minds can kind of flock to them because like realistically if you're a capital a artist and you're just doing different things ball out i don't care um that's that's amazing and you're doing you're exploring mediums and, and getting an amazing uh fulfillment out of that that is one of the coolest things in the world and i highly encourage that but if you want to make money from it i'd it's just kind of the way like it, unless you're a generational artist then it's it's difficult to do that i think i can open up to 
any last questions or I don't know it's been about an hour I don't want to yeah I'll ask my yeah question um can you talk about how the music industry has evolved of how artists um make money and become popularized because I think it kind of goes back to the um conversation you were having about like everyone sounding the same like it's yeah um, you kind of have like before it was you build an artist and they get gold records and platinum and whatever and they have sales and now everyone can potentially listen for free and how how does that work with ad money and clicks and all that instead and less about the album and more about a song release and all that you have to be very um in terms of just getting money in general you have to be very uh what's the word diverse about it like with our artists a lot of the income is uh touring and then merch sales and then brand deals like a, not a lot comes from the the music especially once they're at a level where they are getting the touring brand sales and music like the music's making a decent amount of money but then it's also split up amongst their labels taking a cut management's taking a cut however many people worked on it they all get a cut as well and it's usually a hefty chunk um and then like all of those are diluted so the music itself is making you know you get 100 million streams you can make like a quarter mil or something just off the streaming or whatever but then if that quarter mil is then split up amongst you know 200 people across the whole thing or you know however many are different on each team like the actual amount that the artist gets is like 10 percent, 8 percent, depending unless they're like a big name artist and they can kind of swing around their their ego like that uh but it really just depends um sorry there's a second part of that question i completely lost um i think the the shift in like full album uh to like singles singles yeah yeah that shift has been tiktok's done a lot with that and just the way that people blow up that shift and transition has been a lot because um the theory is at least that like attention spans have gone really down so then the ideal way to build an audience is to have a bunch of different touch points so if you release a one 12 song album in a year, that is a one moment where people will recognize that you are a person and maybe go listen to their art. And like, if that's the way you can convince a stranger, but if you release those 12 singles across a year, once a month, you create 11 more touch points with your audience where you can be like, Hey, Hey, look at me. I'm, I'm a person. And then they might then convert to a, a long time listener and fan. Um, but that's kind of what has driven a lot of that transition. And then from that, the algorithms, early TikTok was just like you post and eventually it'll go viral and someone will look at it and someone will see it. And then that then led into um, record labels really paying attention where they spent their money and did um, and publishers and everyone really in the music industry didn't want to spend money unless it, it was proven because it's so easy easy to prove yourself online or not easy but like people are out there doing it and proving themselves online and gaining an, a large audience without that marketing spend so if record labels don't have to take a risk on like a new artist and they don't have to take anything to like build up followers or because it's all built in and they can just sign talent that already exists out in the world um, because they self-started then they don't have to um, and that's just economically the smarter decision for them. So that that all kind of led into an insane snowball. And then it just started creating a bunch of content and a bunch of people who are just like, just making a fun little TikTok song. But then we're seeing a lot of them flame out and not really become legacy continuing career artists. They just had that one thing. And then now there's a bunch of artists that I can think of that from like 2020 just are not doing the same thing that they would have done because they just like got on the, got on the label and then disappeared from the world.
So that's another thing of being like paying attention to building your team is very important because if they don't offer something that like you really need at the time, you probably don't need it. I have a, another question. 100%. Uh, what's your hot take on physical media? Is it coming back or what do you think? Um, oh, that's something I forgot to tackle a little bit on uh, the artists doing things, but the economy sucks right now. People aren't putting money into things. Um, and for physical media, it takes money to do so on like a large scale if you have the backing and you have a distributor and you can do it or if you're going on tour it makes sense have cds and vinyl vinyl's coming back right now there's a lot of um people open and like making vinyl is pretty easy right now it's expensive but it's it's easy but you kind of have to balance that and be like okay if i want to do a run of like a hundred vinyl for this how much is that going to cost me you got to do it up front if you got to do pre-orders then like you got to have a relationship with whoever your distributor is. Um, but I think physical media is physical mediums are more as an experiential thing than uh, anything else. And if you can build up that experiential part, then that's amazing. But if you can't, then, then uh, you just kind of got to do a like cost benefit analysis and be like, is it worth it? can I spend a night making 20 shirts with my friends for the next show? And then that's really fun versus like doing a whole distribution pipeline thing is it, you got to cost benefit and just really make sure that it's worth it for you at the end of the day. But well, I think, of, oh, sorry. Sorry. I was going to say like in terms of like sales and like how that works, um, I think it's very much uh, just going down but it, it might be coming back up k-pop's kind of weird with that space and that's the main driver yeah i just have seen a lot of people get frustrated with streaming services for video content that get rid of their stuff before they even watch it and then they can't even find it so they have to buy dvds or blu-rays or something of it so i didn't know if the music uh streaming services was kind of the same thing that not everything's accessible anymore so people are starting to get back into physical media to have their own uh, yeah. version i'm not really seeing too much of an issue with that to be honest unless it's like hyper legacy stuff um it's not really an issue i mean there's the the only thing that i can think of is like the recent kanye album is being taken down just because there's a bunch of like random stuff with his distributor but like even then that's kanye you know like shit's gonna happen with him but i we're not really seeing because like in like the video streaming world they keep a rotation of what's on to kind of keep it fresh but like someone's not gonna take off their album off spotify to like hope that people go find it like nine at I don't think that's ever going to be a thing. And if it is, then someone's doing something insane and I'm going to watch it and I'm going to be very excited, but I don't, I don't think it's going to happen. Um, Jacob asked, what do you think the aesthetic roots of hyper pop are? Um, it's just exploring new sounds. Like, I think something that's really important, especially in music is like, we haven't heard a new sound since like 2014. Like the, the last new thing that really happened was like dubstep in terms of like sonic aesthetics. Hyperpop is like new-ish, but it's still like a play on pop. It's not a new genre, but I think something a lot of creatives in general are looking for is to create something new. And that's something that everyone can uh, can resonate with. So looking on like, how do you create something new? And that's, that's what the that's what built up the hyperpop era in terms of like aesthetics it's a bunch of 16 year olds not knowing what a compressor is and just like not knowing like technically how to do it right so then they just did stuff until they liked how it sounded um and then built off that but it is very much just like hyper the prefix hyper in front of any genre you can put it there and it's just like an elevated heightened version gen z um gen alpha extent of that <laughs>
but yeah, it's it's all in the interest of exploring new sounds. And you'll you'll probably see more and more artists doing that. And the blurring of genre is something that's very much been existing in the past like two years. When you say new sounds, do you also mean like literally like in the songs, like especially with uh earlier on dubstep and now hyperpop, the sounds are literally like non-musical sounds like they're like i mean they're like 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 uh 100 gex a lot of their samples are literally just like random like like a water drop or like a car horn or something like that do you, do you kind of mean that kind of thing too yeah 100 percent. i mean you can if you really want to get into the art of it you can track it all the way back to like the aesthetics of john cage and like okay what exactly is art and music and like what is all that stuff music is at the end of the day just like sound over time with meaning so uh, sure sorry i'm moving i need a charger <laughs> oh well if no one else has any other questions you have to get back to work I don't have to. I don't really want to, but I think I need to. But yeah. Um, feel free if you have any other questions outside of it. Um oh, I had my contact information is here. If you need to screenshot it or anything like that, feel free to reach out. Um and yeah, just hit me up if you have any questions on anything in general. Uh, really appreciate taking the time and, and letting me come on here. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.